I know what I'm about to tell you is very, very hard, but you've got to forgive their infidelity. My husband has committed adultery. He has broken our trust. He has violated our marriage, our covenant. And you're telling me that I am to forgive. Do you know how angry I am? How on earth do you ever expect me to forgive? I don't think that I will ever forget what he's done to me. I don't think I will ever forget this shattered trust, and I don't think it can be mended. And you're telling me that I need to forgive just because he's asked for forgiveness. Precious one, listen to me carefully. You're never more like God than when you forgive, and God will help you. The adultery has been discovered. It's either discovered or it's confessed. And in the midst of that confession, in the midst of that discovery, there's a pleading, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I don't know what got into me. I don't know why I did it. I don't know what possessed me. All I know is I don't want you to leave, and I don't want a divorce. I am so sorry for what I have done. Where do you go then? Where do you go then? Well, we've seen that you need to go to God and that you need to read the Word of God and that you need to read the prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and mark these words that deal with adultery and deal with harlotry and understand that God is in the same position that you're in because Israel has played the harlot, Israel who is the wife of God. And so God has answers for us. But the next thing you need to know that if that person is saying that they don't want divorce, then the best thing is to heal that schism. The best thing is to allow that marriage to be healed. Now, I'm not talking about someone that says, I didn't do anything wrong. I, 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 there's nothing wrong with it. I'm sorry I don't love you anymore. That's a different case. That's a different scenario. And we dealt with that last week. But what do you do if they say, I want to stay with you? Will you forgive me? The minute they ask you to forgive them, you may be thinking, then everything's going to be the same. No, everything will not necessarily be the same once you forgive. You may be thinking, I am so angry, I don't know how I can forgive. Well, listen to me carefully. Let me say it again. You are never more like God than when you forgive. Let me take you to Jeremiah chapter 3, and let me show you how God talks to his faithless wife, Israel. He says in verse um, 12, Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger. Come back to me. Come back to me. I will not look on you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Now, there is an anger. There is an anger, and it is a natural emotion. And there should be an anger towards sin. There should be an anger towards anything that hurts and, and wounds and is unjust and breaks God's commandments. That anger is a righteous anger. But he says, I will not be angry forever. So in this forgiveness, you can forgive even though there is an anger. And the anger is more directed at the violation than the violator. Now, I say that, and, and I think, no, you're saying, no, it is directed towards the violator. Well, that's okay. That's okay. It's natural. It's understandable. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with that anger. Now, he goes on to say, this is what 
the wounder is to do. He says, only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God. So he's saying, return faithless Israel, return to me. I will not be angry forever, but there is one thing I want you to do. I do want you to acknowledge your iniquity. I do want you to acknowledge the fact that you have transgressed against me. You have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree. In other words, you've had these lovers and you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. So when you forgive, that person that's about to be forgiven needs to say to you, I have sinned against you. I have violated you. I have broken our trust. I have done what is wrong and I am asking you to forgive me. And so there needs to be that statement. And you need to hear it clearly. You need to hear it and, and, and look at them and look at their face and, and put it in your mind so that in the future, when you start to think about this whole thing, you remember that moment. You remember that time when your husband or your wife turned and looked at you and said, I am sorry. So God is saying, return. And God is saying, I will forgive you. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 16, because in Ezekiel 16, he's talking about her wickedness. He's talking about the fact that she has played the harlot with every stranger that came by, that she has spread her legs, and that is scripture, to every passerby. I mean, with God, it hasn't been one other lover or two other lovers. It has been multiplied idolatry, multiplied adultery, because idolatry and adultery are one in the same to God. Because the minute that they worship an idol, then God says that that is spiritual adultery. So they've gone from one to another, to another, to another. They have multiplied their harlotries and still God forgives. And listen to what he says. He says in verse 59, I also will do with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath by breaking my covenant. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I will remember covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. I, I, I remember what you did. I remember our covenant, and I want you to know I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to establish an everlasting covenant with you. So your mate needs to say to you, I'm promising you before God, I'm not going to commit adultery again. I am establishing an everlasting covenant with you. And then God says in verse 62, thus I will establish my covenant with you and you shall know that I am the Lord in order that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation when I have forgiven you for all that you have done the Lord declares. So God says, I'm going to forgive you, but I want you, I want you to remember, and I want you to be ashamed. And listen, we should be ashamed of our sin. I know that I am absolutely, totally, completely forgiven for my adultery before I became a child of God. I know I'm absolutely forgiven every time that I sin and I ask God to forgive me. I know that I'm forgiven, but I want to tell you there is a shame that goes with my sin, and I am ashamed of the way that I lived, and that's all right. And the Bible says, listen, we're not, we're, we're not to deal with shame. We're not to have shame. Listen, it's good to be ashamed for sin because it shows that you have the right attitude, all right? Now, where do you go from there? Well, the next place I want you to go is I want you to go to Ephesians as we talk about forgiveness. What do you need to know about forgiving? What do you need to understand? Well, let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, this is what he says in verse 31. Let all bitterness 
and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Now let's stop there for a minute and just say this, all right? Your maid has come to you. They have asked for forgiveness, all right? You are to forgive your mate just as as, just as, it's so key, you would underline it in verse 32 of Ephesians chapter 4. You do it just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross? And remember that these men were standing below him and they were saying, Aha, you came to save others. Save yourself. Get yourself down off that cross. Ha! Huh. You're the son of God, you say. If God's pleased with you, why does he have you on the cross? Let him bring you down. So they railed at him, and they were like the bulls of Bashan around a prey. And what does Jesus say to the father? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He not only died for Mary, his mother, standing at the foot of that cross, and Mary Magdalene and the disciples, but he died for those that railed against him. He died for Judas that betrayed him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If we really understood the awfulness of adultery, if we really understood the ramifications of immorality, if we really could get a view from heaven of what it does, not only to us and not only to the one that we've been immoral with, but to our mate and to our children and to our society and to our land, then I promise you, we would have God's perspective on it. And we would know when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what we do, we would know if we had known what we were doing, we never would have done it. Even that mate that does not repent, even that mate that is going to go off and live with the one that they just had an affair with or shack up with them and then a little while later move on to another person, someday that mate is going to stand before a holy God. And he or she is going to give an answer for the deeds done in their body. And they are then going to hear, because they did not repent, because they did not receive Jesus Christ, they're going to hear, depart from me into everlasting fire. And they're going to live for all eternity in flames and torment where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And they are going to live in that situation, remembering the past. Now, if you don't forgive, as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you, you are going to regret it someday. Because even if you're a believer and you stand before Jesus Christ, you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And you're going to give an account for the deeds that you, as a Christian, did in your body. You say, I didn't know that. Where is that? I'll tell you when I come back. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an answer for the deeds done in our body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And listen very carefully. If you refuse to forgive, that is a bad deed. That is refusing to do what God says. In the verse just before, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, he says, this is our ambition, whether I'm in the body or whether I'm out of the body, whether I'm living here or I'm living in heaven. I just have one ambition, and that is to be pleasing to God. And you are never more like God and like Christ than when you are willing to forgive. So let's go back and look at it again. 
Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Now remember, this person is repentant. This person is the one that sinned. You didn't sin, they sinned, and they're bearing the weight of that sin. So for you to lash out in bitterness, for you to just let your anger go, for you to clamor, for you to slander and just cut them down and tear down their character, you are just demeaning them almost beyond recognition. And you don't want to do that. Their sin, David said to God, my sin is ever before me. And so what are you to do? You are to forgive just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Now listen, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Now is your opportunity to walk in love just as, again, a just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. What is he saying? He's saying that when you and I are willing to walk in love, and that love means that there's a sacrifice, and that sacrifice is you don't feel like forgiving, you don't want to forgive, you are so hurt, you are so wounded, you just want to rant, to rave, to talk about it, to discuss it over and over and over again, say, why did you, how could you, what were you thinking of? You want to harp on it, but God doesn't do that. And you are to be like Jesus. You know, once our sins are forgiven, God never mentions them again. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. He puts them behind his back. Listen carefully. He remembers them no more. So you have to do it as Christ did it. And it is a sacrifice. It means it's putting your emotions, your evaluation, your hurt, your wounds, your disappointment, your bitterness, all on the altar and saying, God, I am sacrificing all these things to be like Jesus. Now, go to Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Lord's Prayer, and if you've ever been to church, and you may never have been to church, this may be all new to you, but I want you to know you're listening because we prayed you would listen because God has a message for you. But in Matthew chapter 6, in the Lord's Prayer, part of the Lord's Prayer is this, and forgive us our debtors, those that owe us something. Your mate just transgressed your covenant relationship. They owe you a debt. And God says we are to forgive our debtors just as God forgave our debts. There it is, just as, or it's just as. Forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven our debtors. You're saying, God, I want you to forgive me to the same degree that I've forgiven others. So if you refuse to forgive, then, then you can't ask God to forgive you. You cannot ask God to forgive you. Now listen, when he finishes the Lord's Prayer, he knows that this just stops people dead in their tracks. So he says, if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Do you want to be forgiven in the future? Do you think you'll ever sin against God or against your children or against your husband? Do you want forgiveness? Then you better give forgiveness because you have a person that has repented. You have a person that has a godly sorrow. You have a person that has recognized their sin and confessed their sin and iniquity, and you need to forgive. Now listen, the word forgive is a word that means to send away. You're going to send it away. You're not going to bring it up. You're not going to harp on it. And why are you not going to bring it up? And why are you not going to harp on it? Because you're going to be like God. 
and you're going to forgive. And in that, beloved, you are going to be blessed of God. You want the marriage healed. If you don't want the marriage healed, you're, you're really not thinking clearly. But you want the marriage healed because this is to the glory of God. And this is to the benefit of you. And it's to the benefit of your husband. Listen, when you divorce and then you remarry, believe me, second marriages have a higher divorce rate than first marriages. And not only there, that, but there's going to be an awful, terrible adjustment. And there is, and I hear it over and over and over again, I wish I had not gotten remarried. It has been so hard and so difficult because all of a sudden you have someone else raising your children. You have someone else to adjust to. You have someone else to become one flesh with and one in your thinking and in your marriage. I'm telling you, it is a tangled mess, all the divorces and all the remarriages you need to forgive. Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter comes to Jesus and he says, okay, how many times should I sin if my brother sin? Uh, how many times should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Should it be seven times, up to seven times? And Jesus said, no, it should be seven times 70. Now that's 490 times. Who's going to keep track? And then he tells a story. He tells a story of, of a king who was going to settle accounts. And a man is brought before him because he owes him like $10 million in silver. And the man, he says, put him in prison. He can't pay his debt. And the man falls before the king and he says, forgive me, I'll repay. Now, there's no way he's ever going to repay. It's beyond him to ever repay $10 million in that day. It's beyond him. But the king has mercy on that man and the king forgives that man. And you know the joy of that man. That man's forgiven. He walks away. He sees a man that owes him some money. And he grabs that man and he says, pay me back what you owe me. And so his fellow slave falls down and begins to entreat him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. And he certainly could repay him because it's only one day's wage that he owes him. Now he's been forgiven a $10 million debt and he's grabbing this guy by the throat that owes him a day's wages. And he says, pay me right now. And the guy's saying, look, forgive me, I will pay you. And he says, you pay me right now or you're going to get it. And it says he was unwilling, however, to forgive him. But he went and threw him in prison until he could pay back what he was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved. And they came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, this is the king that had just forgiven him. The others are watching and saying, wait a minute, he just got forgiven $10 million. He was walking sky high. I mean, he was so off the earth because of the forgiveness and, and, and not having to pay that debt. Look at what he did. King, look at what he did. And you just forgave him. And the king says, call him back. So he brings the man back and he says, should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave even as I had mercy on you. And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over, now listen carefully, to the tortures until he would pay back all that he would owe. He missed being forgiven $10 million because he would not forgive a man one day's wage. And he turned him over to the tortures now, this is the bottom line. Jesus is telling this story. Jesus is answering Peter, how many times do I forgive? And he says, verse 35, so, so, bottom line, shall my heavenly Father do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. What do you need to do? You need to forgive your mate who has confessed, who has repented, you need to give, forgive your mate from your heart. And if you won't forgive your mate from your heart, 
you know what's going to happen? God's going to draw back from you. And you know what? You're going to be handed over to the tortures. Because when you refuse to forgive, beloved, you're the one that's held in bondage, not the other person. So you need to let that bitterness go. You need to let that anger go. And you need to forgive as God forgave you. And you need to do everything that you can to restore that marriage. And you say, what else do I need to do? I'm so glad you asked because I'm not finished. And I'm going to tell you next week what else you need to do so that this marriage can be restored, so that this marriage can, can be a healthy marriage and a solid marriage, so that there can be a testimony of the grace of God. Precious one, listen to me again. You are never more like God or more like Jesus than when you forgive. It is the glory of a person to forgive another's transgression, and it is heaven to be forgiven by God.